If you are fans of my channel, you know that I have reviewed many a new slash modern scope. I don't mean new as in brand new in box. I mean new as in they were produced within the last 10 years or so. But I've always had a question in the back of my mind. How good are scopes of old? I apparently wasn't the only one to have this question because one of my viewers was kind enough to offer me this vintage Nikon 4-12x40 adjustable objective second focal plane hunting scope. These things go used, or at least that I've seen on eBay, for around $400. That seems to be a lot of money, especially considering one of these scopes on eBay currently has been claimed to be in a safe for 32 years. It makes me wonder, can this thing hold up optically against more modern scopes? Well, before we get any further into the optics department, let's take a closer look at this thing physically and go from there. One of the first telltale signs that this is a much older scope is the finish. It is a super high mirror black coating on this thing. It is like a mirror. It is absolutely gorgeous. Despite the fact that this thing has been used for probably the better part of three decades, the finish on it is immaculate. The ring marks on it are non-existent, whether from previous owners or myself after I was done with it. The overall scope itself has a very sleek, svelte, almost delicate look to it. That is something that is missing from a lot of modern scopes in my opinion, except for when you go for the super elite hunting scopes, which are designed to be very similar to this, pretty simple, lightweight, and well, easy to use. Speaking of the weight, this thing is sub 17 ounces. It feels like an absolute feather. It's unbelievable. The only thing that I have close on my shelf to compare it to is a 3 to 15 Vortex Razor LHT in the second focal plane, which is still a couple of ounces heavier, but it does have some nice features, namely illumination and a side parallax and a fairly similar magnification range. This Nikon might be old, but it still has some key features that I think is part of the reason why it's still so expensive today. Most notably is going to be adjustable objective, but we'll talk about that very soon. Starting with the eyepiece, this is a locking or standard eyepiece, and it is very, very smooth and fine threaded. Turning this thing is like butter. All the controls on this thing are like butter. It's hard to really put into words how good it feels despite its age. But again, you can very clearly tell this scope has been cared for for an exceptionally long time. I do not know the exact age of this scope, but I'm gonna put it at at least 20 to 30 years old. Moving right along to the magnification ring, you can see that this thing has a very, very short throw, and the splines that are on everything are nice and crisp. You get a really good purchase on there, and they don't feel like they're too aggressive or just too flat. They're a really nice balance. Magnification ring is also buttery smooth. You do have this little ramp that you could jam your thumb against or your finger against and turn it, and I felt that it was more than sufficient for the uses that the scope was designed for. From there, we're going to jump to the front of the scope where the adjustable objective is. This is basically just a focus ring. Side parallax is primarily when you're bringing the target and the reticle to the same plane of existence. This is very similar. It's just all the way out on the front of the optic. You can still buy some modern scopes that have them all the way out at the front. And all it does is move the lens back and forth a little bit to bring things into focus. This is much stiffer than all the other controls as it should be because the last thing you want is this thing wildly turning when you don't want it because all you're going to do is lose your focus of your target at any distance and you're going to be kind of boned. Regardless of it being fairly tight, it is still extremely smooth and easy to operate when you want to operate it. Truth be told, I figured that the scope would have very high quality feeling controls and I was not disappointed in the slightest. It shows that it goes down to 50 yards, but it does go a little bit closer than that. Next up are going to be the turrets, which are capped and very simple to use with a coin. They are easy to adjust and sound and feel fantastic. For that, listen to the onboard audio. The Psycho, a coin to adjust the quarter MOA clicks on the turrets. I don't know if you could pick that up as well as I can. That sounds incredible. Going on to the windage. It 
sublime. The detents are sharp, deep, and crisp. The last thing you need is for this thing to be bumped at a zero, whether under a high recoil from a rifle or from a foal in the forest. Do you need more than that on a hunting scope like this? No, you do not. So what have we learned so far? Physically, it is beautiful with a super high mirrored finish and all the controls feel excellent. But now let's take a closer look at the glass and see how well this thing actually looks to use. I'm not gonna focus on the reticle first because it's a very simple duplex. First, we're gonna track this thing and see how well it performs. Magnification adjustment and adjustable objective adjustment pass with flying colors. The reticle does not shift to the target whatsoever. And it is, well, great. As far as slop to the erectors, both with the windage and the elevation, I was not able to notice any. Again, these are quarter MOA clicks. So at 100 yards, you're getting about a quarter of an inch. Everything seems tight and crisp, just like we saw earlier on the tabletop. And so far, so good with this. Again, no slop to either erector. And everything stays nice and centered when we make any sort of adjustments to the magnification and the focus. However, when we do dial up the elevation to an extreme, you can see that the reticle favors the right-hand side line a little bit. Not only that, the image starts to get a little bit fuzzy towards the top. However, with all that being said, this is designed to get zeroed on a gun somewhere and left alone. So you wouldn't really notice any of those issues in the field. Focusing our attention now on my old 30 yard power transformer, that duplex reticle is about as simple as one can get. Keep in mind the zero on this is the same zero that I run on every single scope that I do, which is a perfect zero for a 22 LR at 50 yards. That's just what commonalities that I use. Bring up the magnification all the way to its maximum of 12X. I can adjust the front objective on this thing to get that American flag looking really, really good. So even though it's measured at 50 yards up front, it can very clearly go closer than that. Because this is second focal plane, the reticle is going to remain the exact same size and the glass will be less stressed. So hopefully this thing will be able to perform exceptionally well. So far, I have to say I'm fairly impressed at the 4X on this thing. The view through it is a little bit on the smaller side. It's a one inch tube, 40 millimeter front objective. Does that really have a lot to play into how this thing looks when you get behind it? I don't really think so. I think it's just very old technology. We do also see a lot of the scope body off to the side, but again, given this thing's age, it still performs better than some other modern scopes that we've looked at so far. I did not adjust the front objective to the distance of our brick building, which is about 400 yards before I brought it to its maximum magnification, but slowly but surely twisting that front bell until we get a good looking image yields a pretty good looking image. The light on this day was extremely sunny with very dark intermittent clouds. So that's why the light will change as drastically as it has. But all things considered, it's a pretty damn good looking image. There's very little purple fringing or chromatic aberration. Everything seems fairly flat. There is some pulling to the image on the outside perimeter, meaning that the image looks like it's warping around a corner but pull back the magnification ever so slightly to around 10 and most of that goes away. Overall, would you be using this thing at 12X all the time on a hunting scope? Not unless you were taking elk in a field somewhere out to a thousand yards, which how many people really do that? Not many. And if you are, are you gonna be taking a shot like that that probably costs thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars between permits and going out there and getting hiking through the woods for days on end? and taking a 30-year-old vintage scope to take a shot like that? Maybe, maybe not. Nevertheless, even here at 900 yards on our power tower, that is a fantastic looking image. You could very easily pick up all of the struts that support that tower, and you could even make out a little bug. I think that was a lanternfly that is walking up that power line in the middle. Actually, I do adjust the focus to show that you could see that. And yep, that's a lanternfly. Do you need much more resolution or sharpness than that? I don't really think you do. Given the fact that this thing is as old as it is, so far I have to say the resolution and the sharpness of the glass is very, very nice. I'm sure the fact that these are made in Japan still has a lot to do with it. Anyway, let's see what the exit pupil slash image stability looks like on this thing. We are at the maximum of 12X, and I have to say it is very forgiving. 
the reticle and the image maintain a very high level of sharpness to one another when we pan past a perfect zero. And that's at 12x. So as we decrease the magnification, as you see here, to around the 10x mark, it should only perform better. Before we check that out, though, look at how good that image looks right there. That's beautiful. Simply beautiful. Edge-to-edge -edge sharpness is extremely high. The color representation does look a little bit muted. It's not as vibrant green as it is to the naked eye. But beyond that, pretty good contrast, pretty good brightness, and a pretty good exit pupil and image stability performance here at around 10x. I do slowly bring it back to its minimum, but just know that every single step in between still performs at least as good as it did at 12x, which is still a pretty damn good performance for a scope as old as this thing is. Another way I can show you how well it performs is with my dynamic eye box test. And at 4x, you can see that this thing is extremely forgiving. You can get very far away from it or choke up on it really close and move side to side with extreme ease. It's one of those things that I love to see, especially on something that's going to be used in a hunting role more than likely. And uh, it's the more the merrier, as far as I'm concerned. Bring it up to about 10x, we have a very similar performance, much larger than most modern scopes, I would say, primarily because it's in the second focal plane. A lot of times we check out first focal plane scopes in this channel, and that's because that's what the cool tactical thing is all about nowadays. But there is something to be said about a very simple second focal plane scope like this, even if it is 30 plus years old. At the maximum of 12x, of course, it's going to get tight, but I could still wiggle around the camera a fair amount and still have a very good view of our target downrange. It might only be at 100 yards, but again, you can see real closely if you pay attention, the reticle does not shift on the target, and overall performance of this thing is extremely high. Because this is technically a hunting scope, a lot of hunters will shoot in lower light environments. Unfortunately, when I want to film this thing in a lower light environment, it was a little bit too low light environment, so I apologize for that. However, at 4x, we can make out that 400 yard brick building pretty easily. And as we slowly increase the magnification, we can still make it out. Uh, contrast is a little on the softer side, but there's very low ambient light. I'm just really happy that I can make out still the smoke stack in the back the air vent on the side and on the roof, and the AC compressors on the right-hand side as well as that power pit wall. It's better than I would say it probably needs to be in conditions like this, which are extremely unfavorable. So far, so good with this Nikon, but it's time to roll in some side-by-side -side comparisons. Typically, I would roll in a lot of varying priced optics and similarly magnified optics for this, but there aren't that many four to 12s that I've actually fully reviewed. So I'm gonna roll in some stuff that's kind of similar to the price point of this Nikon and as close to the magnification range as possible. We're gonna start off with the Helos BTR Gen 2 2 to 12 because it is still one of my favorite optics of the 2 to 12 magnification range, especially for the price, which is as near as makes no difference about the same price as this Nikon is. There's a lot to say about the Helos and how good it is, but it's going to be much heavier than the Nikon, and it's going to be made in China, yeah, but it's at least a brand new scope. And it's a scope that I've shot several hundred to probably just over a thousand rounds through with very little drama. Is it considered a full-on hunting scope as opposed to the Nikon? No, but I don't have dedicated hunting optics yet. I would love to bring on a lot more hunting scopes to branch out my, my, my library, but until that time comes, I have to do the best that I can. We're going to talk more about the Nikon's optical performance as opposed to how the Helos performs, because we should already know how the Helos performs. But the Nikon here at about 190 yards on this berm on this steel target looks exceptional in the center. The outside edge definitely has a little bit more blurring and warping going on, like I mentioned earlier. Moving on to these 200-yard paper targets, don't look at the actual shoot-and-see targets in the middle. Look at the backer itself. They're about the same size, so at least both of these are actually about 12x on the top end. But the view through the helos is substantially larger than what we see with the Nikon, so as a result, we're going to have a larger field of view. Again, these are not really comparable scopes one for one, 
but just showing you what a modern day Chinese optic in or about the price point of this Nikon can perform at. Overall, I have to say that I like these both a lot for different reasons, but the Nikon really does perform beautifully optically in a way that I don't know if I was really expecting. I was going to roll another MPVO of the 2 to 12 variety in, but I decided to just skip it and go straight to another fairly similarly priced, more modern scope, and that's the Primary Arms SLX 4 to 16, which is in the first focal plane. This is another three to four hundred dollar ish scope, and something that I was very impressed with how it performed optically and with all the controls. Again, is the SLX a full on hunting scope? No, but it does offer a lot of performance and features for the price point. At our 100 yard paper targets, both of these show very high levels of sharpness and clarity on these shoot and see targets. Now the SLX does have 4X more up top, which is why everything looks a little bit larger, but it also has a fairly larger view as opposed to the Nikon looking through it. But both of them show about the same amount of scope body. Again, this is not a one-to-one -one comparison. I'm just showcasing what the Nikon can do against more modern rivals. I think the biggest thing I have to worry about with the Nikon is its longevity. Will this scope, which is beautiful, it's, 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 it's something that if you had on your shelf, you would just stare at it, admire it, and wipe off all the dust every single time that you saw a little speckle fall on top of it from the sky. But is it going to withstand the abuse of a lightweight hunting gun? Would it hold zero if you dropped it? Are you going to be taking hunting very seriously? Or are you looking to just complete your grandpa's rifle and have a more retro build where you can pull it out every once in a while, maybe take some game with it, or just bring it to the range and have it look the part? If you were doing that, I have no doubt that the Nikon would perform admirably. But would I trust a 30-year-old scope to take something very serious down, especially if I'm spending a lot of time and money to go out there and do it? I would be nervous about it. And even if you put 100 rounds of 30 out 6 through a 6-pound gun at the range and it holds up fine, who's to say that 101st round isn't going to be the one that's going to go off because it broke in between that? That's the biggest thing I have about this Nikon and buying older scopes in general. A lot of times, it's really cool to buy older stuff either to have as a retro build or just have it on your shelf to admire it. But between this and the SLX, at least the SLX has a warranty. Yeah, that's a little bit of a moot point. And I know the side-by-side -side comparisons weren't as in-depth as I usually go, but how do you compare a vintage hunting scope with a modern non-hunting scope? And again, the only reason why I don't have that comparison is I haven't really reviewed that many different modern hunting scopes. This 4 to 12 by 40 second focal plane Nikon vintage masterpiece, as I'm going to call it, is super impressive. Not only does it look like a vintage Ferrari. I'm going to go there. I'm going real deep. It looks like a vin an old vintage car. It's all polished up and beautiful and got these beautiful streamlined edges. And you can tell that there was care and craftsmanship in there and, and real effort to make it look a very particular way. I don't know if it was form following function or function following form, but it looks like it was sculpted to look a very particular way. And I really admire it for that, especially with the super high gloss finish. It just looks, it looks sexy. Combine that with the fact that all the controls feel super smooth, slick, and polished. And it really makes you wonder how much effort really went into producing this scope that long ago to have it feel as good as it does and look as good as it does when even some modern scopes don't feel as buttery smooth as these do for a significantly higher price point than this. And then on top of that, its optical performance has been nothing short of fantastic. Yes, the outside edge above 8 or so X does get warpy, but that's the only real area where I've noticed an issue with the sharpness of the glass. Inside that, I'd say half to three quarter, even on maximum, it looks gorgeous. And from there, all the way down to 4X, it's extremely usable. And it's got a very forgiving eye box. And it does allow a fair amount of light to come through it. 
if you were to buy one of these to complete a vintage hunting gun, again, whether it's something that your father owned, your grandfather, or something that you just wanted to build to have it in your safe or on your wall above your fireplace, would this fit the bill as not only something that looks beautiful, but performs beautifully and you could actually use? I think this fits that role to the T. Now, no, this is not the only vintage hunting scope out there. There are plenty others, but this is just one such example that, in my opinion, still holds up to today's standard of fit, finish, qualitative feel, and usability. Overall, I am painfully impressed by this thing's performance, and I cannot wait to try out more vintage stuff in the future. So, with all that being said, thank you all very much for watching. Thank you to the subscriber for sending this in for review, and as always, I'll see you again next time. And a huge thank you to my Patreon providers and my Subscribestar subscribers. Without you, this truly wouldn't be possible. If you'd like to support my channel but don't want to join either of those, I completely understand. But you could still help by using my affiliate links in the description below, and or like, share, and subscribe as always. Again, thank you very much.